Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and I'm back with our Washington policy research team uh, to dig into the post-Trump world. What is the Trump trade? What are the themes? What should we be thinking about on both the long and the short side? There's a ton to think about here. I'm really excited to get into all of that with all of them. And first, I'm going to go with Neil Howe, who's, of course, our head of demographic research, our chief of all things demography. Neil, what do you think is going on now? Well, that was an amazing election, wasn't it? <laughs> and just looking back at what happened, uh, an historical first in so many ways. It's interesting, now that we're several weeks past, we're, const we're finally counting up the, the popular vote, right? Yep. So about um, 2.4, 2.6 million advantage. Uh, for Clinton over, over Trump. And it's interesting, this is the only, the, 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 probably the, 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 the most incredible election in that we've never had a time when someone has lost the popular vote by so much and won the presidency without going to the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. right? You did, an, it was basically a, a beautiful historical compilation. Beautiful being that we don't have to read too, too long because a lot of people don't like to read <laughs> right. anymore. Uh, but you wrote, you wrote a, a, a really good piece really uh, differentiating Reagan conditions uh, versus right. Trump. Right. And that's, that's your point. Well, and, and you know, and, and basically what I went is kind of, kind of blow by blow, you know, what, what accompanied Reagan when he came in. Mm -hmm huge youth generation coming into the workforce, mm -hmm. uh, which gave him 1.4% increase in working age population per year, right? Guess what that is for Trump over his first four years? 0.2. Ooh, so that's an enormous increase in just free GDP growth from new warm bodies, yep. right? Plus, you had all the women coming into the workplace back then. That mm -hmm. was an extra kicker, maybe half a percentage point of GDP per year. Today, women are leaving the labor force. Kind of an interesting phenomenon we talk about, a kind of Gen X, Gen X married women, actually, more than anyone else, leaving the labor force. Mm -hmm. um, what else is going on? Um, well, uh, uh, debt you, levels. Yeah. Debt levels. The debt back when, when Reagan came were the lowest we've ever seen for the federal debt. I mean, it was the low post-war low point, right? It was down around 30, 33%. Uh, Reagan took it way up. Basically, the point is whether non-financial uh, debt uh, uh, as a share of GDP or federal debt as a share of GDP, we had a uniquely favorable moment in 1980, and it gave a lot of unused debt capacity. Reagan used it up subsequent, and now we're way out at these unprecedented levels. Um, I think another interesting thing to point out is back when Reagan came in, the net national savings rate uh, 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 was around nearly 8%. Today it's around three point something, it's less than half. Back then we had a current account deficit that was actually briefly in surplus in 1980, mm. which is a rarity in the post-World War II era. Now it's down at, I don't know, three point something percent, about where it was at the time of the Plaza Accord. Mm. So this is interesting. Trump is coming into office at the current account deficit point, which forced Reagan to cry uncle at the end of his first term after he had run all these huge deficits and had this huge current account deficit and pushed the dollar way up through the stratosphere. And he finally had to say, okay, in our next term, we're going to raise taxes, reduce the deficit. We're going to get other countries to raise their you know, interest rates. We're going to kind of, we're going to go back. You know, we can't keep going this direction. Trump is starting here. Something doesn't compute here. What's he going to do? He's going to start a huge fiscal stimulus at this point in the current account deficit? And what's that gonna do to all of his jobs in Peoria, all these export-oriented jobs? Hmm. So, I mean, this is the point. How much further is that dollar gonna go up and how much longer can his constituency, right, the one he ran on, stand it? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, then, and, then, and then finally just point out, and you know, anyone can go and read the thing, we line these all up. But I think valuations, I mean, come on, valuations, and, and Greenspan actually had a recent, uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, a recent uh, interview where he talks about this, how pitifully the stock market was valued back when Reagan came to office. The, the economy had been traumatized by stagflation, right? I mean, these enormous interest rates and high inflation just wreaking havoc with firm balance sheets at the time. You remember the controversy of inventory accounting, first yeah. in, first out, and how, <laughs> how inflation you know, made the, just the choice of inventory methods, like a huge bottom line considering mm -hmm. everything was crazy back then. Um, 
the, the typical firm on the, on the S&P 500 was trading its market value as something like 30% of its replacement cost. I mean, that's how low it was. And we go through these, these valuation estimates. The, you know, uh, Robert Schiller's CAPE, you know, the cyclically adjusted PE ratio, is that it's just absolute record lows. Well, today it's at record highs. And you can go through all <laughs> these different valuations, plus you've got corporate uh, profit margins within at a very low ebb, today or at a high ebb, we assume these things are mean reverting. So you got a lot of stuff that is heavily weighted, heavily predisposed the economy to a boom uh, starting in the early 80s and today are not predisposed in that direction now. Mm -hmm. and, and having said all that, let me just add this. Whenever you have a big regime change, even one that was kind of so favorably spring-loaded as, as it was back in 1980, you expect some bloodletting, okay? And Reagan did have bloodletting. Big time. Let's not forget that from the end of November, about a month after the election. In the Reagan uh, election, yeah. Yeah, after the Reagan election in 1980 to August 12th, 1982, which is what, about 22 months or something mm -hmm. like that, the S&P fell by 27%. And remember, a lot of inflation back then. So in real terms, it was down about 35% decline. Now that's a bear market. Mm -hmm. And people don't remember that. People always just think, Reagan came in and we had the big boom. Wasn't quite like that. Wasn't quite like that. We had to go through the Volcker recession. You remember, there was, it was a terrible time for us before we came out of that. So my point is, do we expect a regime change such as that Trump is coming in with this whole new this, this, this whole new program rooted in sort of populism and authoritarian kind of nationalism, this very different way of, of dealing with, with, with the public, giving them not process but results, right? I'm gonna guarantee this, guarantee this. <clears throat> a very different kind of economic program, a very different kind of view of our future <clears throat> without a rupture, without a rupture in the markets. Mm. I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. I think I think if you look ahead a year, uh, certainly look well. Look ahead, look ahead six months or a year. Uh, it, you're not going to find a smooth transition. Too many things are changing directions: inflation expectations, interest rates, um, uh, and uh, wage acceleration, which may accompany that. Just a lot of things Love are so. going to change the mix. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know, Keith. I, I mean, you tell well, me. No, I, I think, think that that's a good. I think <clears> that that's a good answer, and I think that that's you know, probably where we should always end with, with I don't know. Like, well, I don't know. And when somebody wakes up every day and tells me from his tower that he knows, I'm going to remind myself that he doesn't know and I don't know. And I think that that's a good place for us to start. So that's a good, um, I think that's a good, we'll start, we'll start tomorrow. We'll start working on that again tomorrow and the day after that. <laughs> trying to figure <laughs> out what go. we actually do know. Because that's yeah. going to be an important thing to measure and map. So, Great. thank you very much. Okay, appreciate thank it. you. Now I'm with General Emo Gardner, who heads up our defense policy research team, just to go through what Trump might mean to his world, which includes tweets. You know, the, today, today we get the tweets, but before tweets, I want to get into you know, what you think are the three kind of big things going on, and then maybe we can go into some of these distractions. <laughs> well, I think, uh, of course, he's based his entire campaign on making America great again, and uh, uh, the various aspects, but when you when you start breaking that down, uh, clearly one of the his uh, emphases has been on improving or growing the Defense Department. I yeah. think uh, a lot of questions about how he would actually use the force. What he is talking about, uh, everything he has said, is to uh, increase the size of uh, the force and uh, its uh, utility, make it uh, make it great again. I I. Uh, I sometimes wonder about the policy that it would actually employ it with. I, I, I describe it as something like a revengeful isolationism. Uh, hmm. On the one hand, he talks about not really being um, involved overseas and has talked about some of the, uh, the folks that we've deposed, Hussein, et cetera. Maybe it was better if they just stayed there. But on the other hand, he talks about a really powerful uh, military uh, that once it engages, it is uh, absolutely decisive. Hmm. Um, They've set themselves up uh, in, uh, by putting in a continuing resolution. Uh, we're in fiscal year 2017 now. Um, 
my, we did not really pass a uh, 17 budget here before Christmas. What they've done is they've extended the last year's spending levels up until April 28th. And what that means, that puts the onus on the, on the new administration to not only look forward to the upcoming budget, but the current budget as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an opportunity. I believe that uh, um, it's an opportunity to uh, symbolically put in a large amount of money. I think there'll be a plus up of about $15 billion. Wow. And that can go uh, directly into uh, whereas the current budget uh, passes, conforms to the, the Budget Control Act and the budget uh, caps. Um, he can go in and, and you know, show that he is fulfilling his promise and right away $15 billion in this year money. And then I think he'll follow up quickly with an FY18 budget um, that will be submitted somewhere in, in late spring. It'll be mm -hmm. later than, than, uh, than required, but is actually normal for a new administration. And I think we'll see a large uh, pattern there. Now, Obama had uh, um, proposed a budget for FY18. It was $33 billion above the Budget Control Act. So if um, President-elect Trump is going to do something. It's got to be bigger than Obama. You got to figure it's going to be above that number. Well, I've got some uh, uh, charts here. We uh, we're, uh, we're going to show what uh, um, looking out there. I he's going to he has mentioned before that the um, that the top line for the Pentagon ought to be closer to what it was before all this sequestration business began in 2013. So when you go to the Presbud 2012. Uh, budget and you you straight line it out to 2018. Um, the budget it's about 120 billion dollars difference between That's the huge. budget control act and that number. Uh, <laughs> Obama was moving 30 billion towards that number. There's been some overseas contingency operations, OCO money towards it, but I, I'm looking at about overall maybe a 30 billion dollar increase to the defense top line uh, over time. He's not going to make it easy. He's, I think he has to show toughness on the other side. I think uh, the tweet, uh, uh, I heard the interview yesterday on uh, Fox News, and I guess there's a tweet out today on uh, the F-35 program in particular, uh, saying it's out of control. Um, and of course, this had wide impact, and, and I see that some of those stocks are down 4 and 5% uh, today. Lockheed, Northrop, uh, Pratt & Whitney makes the engines, UTX. Um, Similar to his comments on Air Force One, which is the Boeing product, um, I think there's a little bit of jawboning here. Mm. Um, there really is no option to the F-35. This is uh, the only <laughs> fifth generation aircraft made. Uh, it costs $60 billion to develop, and now we're moving up the production ramp. There's supposed to be 63 procured uh, in um, FY-17, and uh, that is gonna ramp up to somewhere around 100 or 120 uh, U.S. buys per year for the next decade or so. So, um, as I mentioned, I think this is a jawboning. Um, you know, maybe it's a dip, right? Uh, th those companies have been uh, all defense companies have been flying high based on uh, they have the products and they've developed them. Uh, we're moving into production phases. If you're going to spend more money to make America great, this you. You have to buy something with that yep. money. Yeah, and it might be on a different duration than what the market would have thought, because you have, like you said, you have the CR, you have two budgets. Yes. A lot of people don't understand that, that there could actually be two budgets in the same year. So yeah. there's, there, there's just a time shifting from this intermediate term uncertainty to this long term. I mean, how many people are out there with 120 billion? That's a, that's a really yeah. big number. Uh, is that a debatable number? Is that going <clears> to <throat> be a hot potato with the tea party, What's, what, what do you think that's It will be, uh, it's, a, it's a ramp, and we couldn't, I mean, I don't think the Pentagon can absorb anywhere near that kind of money. There'll be some kind of ramp to it, and you gotta question whether we'll actually ever get to the top of that ramp right. before all this is gonna fall apart. But I think for, we're going to see, I think symbolically, he has to um, propose a higher budget. Yep. And uh, it has to go towards I think it will, he'll try and put it towards what I call shovel-ready programs. Yep. He's going to put it in areas, uh, um, programs that are already in production that you can uh, easily increase the production of and, and actually show 
um, demonstrate and actually have a product come out much sooner. If you, many defense programs are such long cycle, long duration, um, that um, you, you don't really see the benefit for yep. a long time. But if he can go up to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where they make the joint line tactical vehicle and they're supposed to make 5,000 vehicles, pretty easy to ramp that up to 7,500 vehicles and have a, have a rally and announce that uh, we're going to hire 250 workers. And thank you to Rust Belt State of Wisconsin for voting for me, and I'm keeping my promise. Hmm. Longer term, um, I like uh, shipbuilding. Um, is, is true consensus out there, bipartisan consensus, that we need to grow the Navy. It's on track now to grow to, uh, uh, to be at uh, 308 ships by, uh, we, don't, we have on the order 280 today, 308 ships by 2021, um, and the goal seems to be, is going to be raised to 350. So um, we have a duopoly that produces ships in this country, GD and HII. Um, there's a number of uh, companies. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is uh, as maintenance costs on ships have increased, we've tended to retire those ships mm -hmm. and then build new ones. Um, if you want to grow the force, you've got to slow down the number of retirements. So I think you're going to see some uh, increased money go towards extending the life of some of our current ships. Mm. BAE uh, is very large in uh, ship maintenance as well as uh, the government shipyards. Um, uh, GD, HII, uh, some of the suppliers, it's actually going to be an issue with supply if you try and increase the number of ships, uh, qualified suppliers and vendors. Um, BWXT produces the reactors for submarines. Um, these are very long legal items, six to seven years. Um, that's why you can't ramp up overnight, but they'll yeah. be certainly... Uh, and they're also, like away. you said, for a guy who wants to show this military power and strength yes. and appeal to his base are you know, readily apparent, uh, shipbuilding yards in particular. That's right. And the jobs, uh, and he'll get, he'll get democratic support. Many of these uh, yep. jobs are in the democratically dominated Northeast. You know, obviously electric boat and mm -hmm. uh, these are in Bath, Maine. Um, so yeah, there's really, it's difficult to not to, not to see how, uh, uh, you know, shipbuilding has got to go up. Yeah, I agree. pressed against it. Makes, it. That's a really interesting investment idea. Just one other question on, because I know that you and both you and General Chrisman, who's on our uh, team, had, you, you, I don't know if it was an anxiety or just a uncertainty of what, you know, Trump could appoint to his team. Now we have three, right. three generals or four, uh, some number greater than right. zero, as opposed to chastising generals and calling them out for this, that, and the other. Yeah. Are you happy or uh, or not with what he's done so well, far? Well, I'm, I'm one of a vanishing breed. I'm one of the few retired Marine generals that hasn't been offered a post. But the uh, <laughs> so I'm actually uh, uh, Jim Mattis has been uh, put up for Secretary of Defense. He and I are of the same uh, yep. cohort. We've um, served together for a couple of decades. Uh, and uh, uh, John Kelly, who was um, going to Homeland Security, um, General Flynn, um, I know of him. Uh, and he is at the national security thing. There's a lot of interesting dynamics there, personal dynamics uh, uh, going on. I am encouraged that uh, I know both of those individuals are extremely competent, uh, not uh, particularly uh, not operating on some personal agenda, true patriots. Mm -hmm. um, they've got to get the right teams behind them. I'll be very interested to see um, how that goes, uh, who becomes uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. I understand that we're going to um, hear that this week. Um, knowing General Mattis, um, I think he can really be outstanding with regard to policy and, and be the outside guy in an outside inside team. I hope that they pick a deputy who is an inside guy that can manage the business of the Pentagon, mm -hmm. uh, the acquisition aspects. It sounds like he got up to speed pretty quickly there. I mean, yeah. if people can say he didn't have a plan, or if he did have a plan, this sounds like yeah. it's a Fine. pretty good one so far. You know, competent people in each of the positions, and now it'll be interesting to see how he manages them and where they go. And yeah, um, the, the Obama administration much criticized for being too centrally managed by the NSC. I don't, I don't really think that's what we're going to see. No, that's that's great. I mean, competent patriots just like yourself. Yeah. So, so thank you very, uh, okay. very much for the update. Yeah, thank you. Now I'm with our head of telecom and media policy research, Paul Glencher, to get into what's changed. Not, not a lot's changed since the last time we talked, has there? Uh, maybe a little bit. <laughs> changed just a tad, just you know? 
So what do you think? Wow. Um, it's a huge change in yeah. terms of, of what people were thinking going into the, uh, not just that Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump, um, but that the whole deregulatory agenda now that's going to take over the telecom media space um, is, just, is just a gigantic, I think, impact in terms of how people have seen the trend. The trend has been that if you are a big network provider, mm -hmm. you know, Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, that you're being commoditized, you're just going to be a dumb pipe and then everyone who uses it rides it as inexpensively and as free as possible. Mm. The idea being that consumers then will have easy access to all the content, big, small providers that they could possibly want to have access to, and the distributors, the network guys who spend billions building these networks, just ship it, um, and they're just stupid pipes. And now they're thinking, you know, maybe we can get into some of these adjacent markets. Now, they were in them to some extent, Comcast bought NBC Universal, but could there be more of that? And mm -hmm. then we saw it, AT&T buying Time Warner. And that was even before the election. Mm -hmm. So I think what you'll see now is the idea that different models can emerge. And the trend, I think, favors the network builders, the investors who've built these huge wired and wireless networks, and that they'll have greater flexibility to explore models, uh, acquisitions, that could give them you know, greater um, heft, greater capability, greater scale, mm -hmm. um, diversify revenue streams, explore new models. I think it's, it's, it's going to open up a lot of experimentation for those guys. So instead of having this kind of socialized system where they're literally like utilities right. and valued as such, now they can actually turn themselves into something transformational, or at least attempt to. A lot of people would say that that may not work, but who knows? They never really had a deregulatory environment where they could try it. That, that's, right, that's right. Well, certainly in the last several years, it's been yeah. heavily regulated. And it's just a different philosophy. Yeah. The philosophy has been you want big and small providers democratize the Internet. And, yeah. it's, it's, and it's a laudable objective. And I don't think that goes away in the mm -hmm. sense that um, you have a network guy who can say, Verizon can say, no, we don't like you. You're not going to travel on this network. That's not going to happen. Um, and certainly there'd be a huge political backlash if they tried something like that. But it's the idea that, you know, we own this service and we own that service and, and an opportunity for edge providers who want to invest in certain types of transmission capabilities can pay for them. Um, there is a demand for that. And we've had 1-800 calling in this country forever. I mean, all over the world, you can have toll-free calls. You can have FedEx. Uh, and pay the delivery charges to people. We, we've always done that. Mm -hmm. So why not on the internet? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to move toward. Now, again, you can't eliminate net neutrality. You can't have a situation where if you're not willing to pay X, you cannot reach your user. But I think we can get into more of the, the um, experimentation with upstream sponsored data payments. You see it on wireless mm -hmm. where people can access content and they don't have to pay on their data charges for it. They don't have to pay surcharges. It's great for consumers. And I think this is something what the regulators have been worried about for a while, which is the idea if enough of this happens, you have uh, these sort of upstream payments where people essentially get data-free access, mm -hmm. or they perceive it to be cost-free data usage, they're going to get hooked on it. Mm -hmm. You see it with Binge On, with this T-Mobile program where mm -hmm. you get Netflix and other things, and, and although Netflix and others aren't paying for it, by reducing the resolution of the video on the small screen, um, it actually saves a lot of capacity for T-Mobile. So they're actually doing it without charging the upstream provider to pay for the data usage of the subscribers. Subscribers love it. They just love it. It gives them the freedom to just stream and not worry about things. And if you start spreading that across other networks and other services, people get hooked on it. Yeah, especially people with no money. I mean, you, I think young people in particular, they're going to sure. be binging. You know, free is nice. <laughs> you know, I, I go to the grocery store and say, yeah, i got to pay for the milk? Really? And it's the same thing. People love free. Uh -huh. And so the, the problem that the regulators have seen with that is that the bigger players are the ones who can pay the freight. Um, and if you get in a situation where that becomes a, a new cost that edge providers, content providers have to incur, well then it's only going to favor the biggest ones that can afford to pay it and smaller voices and the next Facebook and the next uh, you know, Amazon will have a problem beginning to emerge, mm -hmm. the next Netflix. But uh, you know, these are nightmare scenarios and I think the feeling is that let the network providers 
have greater freedom to do this. Consumers can benefit. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some small entities might want to go ahead and have the opportunity to pay mm -hmm. because they want to say to a user, hey, this won't cost you. Check out our service. Check out our product. So it can actually encourage smaller players to get into the game in ways that heretofore they, they haven't been able to. Hmm. How about from a leadership perspective, just shifting gears a little bit, head of the FCC and what this looks like going forward, any big change? It's big. Um, you've had uh, Tom Wheeler, chairman of the FCC, who imposed net neutrality and new privacy rules for internet service providers that would impair their ability to tap the digital advertising markets that a Facebook and Google dominate today. So now, you know, Google and Facebook need to be thinking about how the privacy rules could change to favor the network providers in a way that could create more competition in that space, which is a good thing. Um, and the Republicans have dissented against all of this largely calling a lot of the FCC concerns under the Obama administration as solutions in search of a problem. We don't have the kind of rampant blocking of content and such that everyone is worried about. So if we don't have it, why are we regulating it to prevent <laughs> exactly. what's not happening? So their feeling is, let's, let's let the market play out. If there's abuses, we have the antitrust laws, and we could always come back and regulate it again if we really had to mm -hmm. um, in some way. Um, and there's Federal Trade Commission regulations out there too. So I think that um, you're going to get a regime now, most likely under the senior Republican on the commission, Ajit Pai, um, who will say, you know what, let's get rid of all these regulations. Let's let the market run free. If abuses develop, then we'll address them then. But let's not put a lot of prophylactic regulation on the books, distorting people's investment incentives without knowing that we have a real problem. I think that's what you're going to see. So is that, 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 that could explain why people are having some anxieties with these Facebooks and Googles of the world, because the rules really are going to change. I think they are. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, you, you go all the way back. Like, take AT&T was actually the old SBC under Ed Whitaker. And Ed Whitaker always said, people ain't riding my pipes for free. <laughs> and um, I didn't put billions into this to give it away for free. So I think there's a certain nervousness that you know, there could be some additional costs, and I think most likely there will be. Mm -hmm. That if, if you're Netflix, for example, and you know, you're running on a wireless network, and you're up against DirecTV Now, which is AT&T's mobile video service, at a fairly good price point, data included, um, you know, you're up against that now. And the question is, is how is that going to affect you? Are we, what are you going to pay? What kind of deals will you cut? And, and so it, we don't know all the answers to this, but, uh, and actually the old net neutrality rules are still on the books. Um, they're just going to essentially be suspended, I think, in effect, one way or another by mm -hmm. this, this current, the new commission. But they do need to think about, well, how does this change our model in terms of the costs we may incur to reach our users? It, it does raise uncertainty about mm -hmm. that. What do you think the most abrupt uncertainty, I guess, uh, could occur is in your world? like a shorter term. Oh, well, I think what, what we, we could see is more consolidation in a hurry. Yeah. Um, because uh, take, for example, you know, what people are thinking now that the regime is changing. If DirecTV Now, which is part of AT&T, really takes off as a service that can compete against other wireless services or give people alternatives who don't want to subscribe to legacy video services, the old subscription model over, over a wired network. Yep. It, it could be a game changer. You've already had Dish Network Sling out there doing the Sony View over the PlayStation. Um, you have Comcast that has NBC Universal content. Now AT&T's buying Time Warner. So you're thinking, wow, there's so many things you might be able to do if you have the right assets, mm -hmm. the right weapons, um, the right arrows in the quiver. And if you do, well, you can maximize the upside of all that kind of investment now. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should make more of it. For so example, it's like the right yeah. content over the right pipes, effectively. I think so, That's and how you do it. See, <clears throat> people will say, well, why is AT&T buying Time Warner? Why don't they just cut contracts and say, you know, we'll do an HBO partnership or something? Well, when you own the content, you can do what you want with it. Mm. You don't have to cut a contract. If, for example, someone else comes up with some wireless service that um, has a certain content attached to it, you think, wow, it'd be great if we could do this with HBO. Well, we have to call Time Warner, we've got to sit down in a room and negotiate a license. You don't have to do it, you just do it. And I think the, that, that when the network providers have the freedom to pursue whatever business model that could possibly work for them and make that investment, 
Well, that kind of flexibility drives a lot of potential innovation. Mm. And if you see something happen in the market, you say, we need to respond to that, boom, you respond to that. Well, that's a dramatically different scenario for someone like Netflix. I mean, if, it's huge. Because if everyone just starts buying up the content that, that Netflix would like to have. You got it. Then they're only going to have to rely on their own content. They're going to have, and, and that's going to you know, ramp the cost. It's going to be a very different business model. Yeah, but, but it could be, all right, so what makes them more strategic? In ter- look at, I don't know what they What makes Netflix do. more strategic? Yeah, what yeah. makes them, what's their strategic <coughs> option mm-hmm. here? Because mm-hmm. they see where the pressures could be building. Mm-hmm. Their own content, we haven't seen, I think, a lot of the specific numbers on the take on that, but you know, whether it's House of Cards or whatever. If they get, do they need to, for example, get more engaged on that in some efficient way mm-hmm. um, that makes sense for them to produce more of that content and build on their subscriber base now? I mean, there's been a lot of speculation about deals involving Netflix, uh, mergers, acquisitions, and such. They may or may not make sense, but I think that the, the discussion picks up because the space is changing so much, and mm-hmm. they're up against these kinds of uh, you know, changes and, and, and the new sort of asset strategies that the distributors can have. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like, I mean, this year for us is going to be pretty exciting, especially for you. Oh, <laughs> if I, we I go down will. this deal of, do- like the kind of a, a domino of deals, I mean, this is because you've been on the record one of the first people and, and you deserve a lot of credit for that on the, on the Time Warner AT&T deal. I mean, that stock price is a lot higher than where it's currently trading still. So there's still a lot of skepticism out there on these things actually getting done. And I think a lot of people may not understand the new regime uh, first and foremost, but also how those dominoes could fall. I mean, oh, it's going to happen really quickly. It could change very, very quickly. And, and, then you, and it's not just your traditional content players like Time Warner, AT&T, Charter, NBC, etc. It, 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 it involves Amazon. It involves Google. Exactly. It involves Facebook. Facebook has already uh, quietly, uh, apparently, have been, has been sort of running up the flagpole, the idea with the regulators that well, what if we have a special Facebook essentials type of product ah. that we'll pay for and, the, and, and it won't touch the user, the user won't have to subscribe or pay anything, data charges for it over their wireless. We'll do that. They're actually exploring that in other countries. Mm-hmm. Can they do that here? Well, under this current Obama regime, yeah. this FCC, that, no, we don't go there. And in fact, they're already working up an opinion at the FCC right now that's going to essentially say that what they're doing with DirecTV Now, paying the data charges for the, the wireless users of, of DirecTV Now on an AT&T, an AT&T subscriber, they say that that's illegal under the net neutrality rules. The problem is for various reasons, I don't think they can enforce that. So I don't think it's going to hurt AT&T, but it's going to send a signal out there on it. So something like Facebook, you know, they probably have a problem with that. But on the other hand, Facebook looks at the upside to that. If you can lock people in, and you're selling digital advertising, you know, you can say, our users don't turn us off. <laughs> They're sticky because yeah. they don't have to pay. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, and, and I'm not saying that's all Facebook is saying about it, but you can see the strategic value. Well, that. I mean, they watch Amazon every day. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that, that's the point. Oh, they're, sure. They're seeing things that they've not yet done. But, but, you know, if you're a consumer and you listen to this, you're thinking, oh, my God, all these services? I can just go, go to the mall, you know, because, you know, my wife drags me to the mall and my daughter drives me to the mall or my son wants Nike tennis shoes and I don't want to go but I can just sit around and stream the you know whatever and I don't have to pay for it I mean that's pretty good <laughs> I, I, this could be a great situation for consumers yeah and it, it may sort of interfere with the sort of the net neutrality open democratized internet purity that this administration has wanted to pursue in mm-hmm. this FCC but you're going to have a lot of potential consumer benefit in this which will drive I think deals and other things that will happen but I think consumers could see a lot of gain in this. What you don't want to see, I'm not saying that the network guys will be able to just run the show and nothing else matters. I think if they go too far in impairing or inhibiting new services from developing, if there's a sense they're blocking that, mm-hmm. I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat running the show, I think there's going to be a problem. But I think what we're going to go into is a period or a transitional phase here where more business models, revenue models, ways to monetize that network investment will be explored. And I think consumers in the near term could benefit a lot. I like that. Sounds like free market capitalism. That's a good thing. What a concept. Huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. You Appreciate it. it. Sure. Now I'm here with our head of healthcare policy research, the one and only Emily Evans, right from Nashville. Warmer. <laughs> Not really. Not really. <laughs> no. Oh my God. Well, uh, it wasn't snowing when I left. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. That's good. What's going on? Top three. Uh, I guess you have three big 
bullet points on consumer driven you know, post Obamacare. Right. So we have um, the way the Repu route the Republicans are going to take to ensuring everybody um, is very, very different from what, philosophically very different from what Obamacare is based on. And really, health policy in this country since probably the mid 1990s, early 1990s. Um, and that is a shift towards consumer driven health policy, which is getting consumers to make choices and to participate in the purchasing decisions of healthcare. Um, and this is radically different from a more of a top-down approach that was advocated, it originated at Dartmouth College and um, spread throughout the Clinton administration mm -hmm. uh, and, and then into, um, uh, into the Obama administration. And that's more of a, oh, people overutilize the system and you need to control utilization, um, which isn't really the truth, <laughs> but that's what they were they were going with. Um, so the uh, the consumer driven um, health policy that the Republicans are advocating for um, is to use tax policy first and foremost, um, and that's using tax credits, refundable tax credits, so people can purchase insurance, which is uh, similar to what you've uh, you saw with Obamacare, but um, it's. It's designed to be a little bit more flexible. You don't have to buy those tax, those insurance policies on, on um, government uh, run uh, exchanges and things like that. Uh, the other use of tax policy is H use of HSAs, expanded use of HSAs, which um, for many years has really been constrained by the IRS and the costs mm -hmm. of, of doing that, and they want to expand that. Um, health we, we had those in. I know I had that with two separate employers that tried it in the early 2000s, and, and I guess it, it just never took hold, it never broadened. It these would, are these flex accounts? Yeah, and because a lot of it was constrained by the amount of money you could put into it each year, and by the idea that at the end of the year, it disappeared Right. if you didn't use it. Which, so what are you gonna do? If you're pretty healthy, you're gonna really constrain yourself. When, well, the Republicans are gonna allow that to roll over. They're gonna allow that to roll to your spouse. Things that make it a lot make sense. Make sense. Like yeah. if I put money in an account, like in a flex spending account, on a pretext, and basis. I'm not sick or I don't have you know really you know any reason to go, then I can give it to my son, right? To my kids, or your or, or your spouse or whoever needs it, right? Um, okay. In order to purchase purchase health uh, health care, okay. and the idea is that you use that for things like well baby visits and your flu shot and you know your the uh, your you know 50 year old colonoscopy um, and you save your insurance policy which probably has a 5000 or 7500 dollar deductible for those instances where you really need serious health care okay. hospitalization um, major procedures that kind of thing um, health reimbursement accounts uh, were actually is another tool where your employer actually can help pay for your health costs. Let's say your employer doesn't have a plan. So it's pretext. It, right, and he doesn't have a he doesn't have a plan. Can't sponsor a plan, but wants to help. Yep. Um, and that's what an HRA does. The uh, Affordable Care Act pretty much got rid of those, and they actually, uh, ahead of repeal and replace, have been instituted um, in the 21st Century Cures Bill that passed. Oh. Um, uh, late, where are we? This is Monday, so it was late last week. Um, so the, the second part of the consumer-oriented or consumer-driven health policy that, that the Republicans want to shift to is more insurer options, more insurance options. Mm -hmm. um, and you've heard the famous, I'm going to get rid of the lines during the Republican debate um, that Marco Rubio made such fun of uh, with Donald Trump. What he's talking about is allowing insurers to say, sell across state lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and which is not really a proven concept. Um, we're going to have to see what happens. The, anal the, the analogy there is more, if you remember, um, when Citibank started issuing credit cards out of South Dakota because South Dakota didn't have uh, interest rate caps. It, it's the same idea. As an insurer, you could pick your state, your primary state, and you would operate under those insurance laws okay. and then sell into any state you wanted to. Um, and, and you wouldn't have to conform with really high, really onerous insurance laws like New York and California have, for yep. example. Um, and that would allow your UNHs and your Aetnas and so forth to really spread their, um, th their footprint out you mm -hmm. know, uh, fairly quickly. Um, the other thing it allows for is uh, m people to pool, and this is something that um, Republicans have wanted for a long time, is for people to pool the purchase of insurance um, outside of employers. Like 
alumni groups or um, church organizations or hockey teams or, <laughs> or whatever. A group of people um, could go and pool their risk and purchase insurance instead of it being employer. Yeah. You know. Um, so that's another uh, consumer-driven idea, more options um, mm -hmm. and access to insurance through, through more options. And then the third consumer-driven idea is uh, Medicaid reform. <clears throat> Medicaid reform, there's sort of two buckets of Medicaid population. Um, the, the first bucket is people who are really poor and yeah. who uh, are suffering from addiction, abuse, you know, those kinds of things, and whose lives are so broken that uh, the idea that they're going to move into employment or is, is, is fairly remote. And then there's this population, courtesy of the Affordable Care Act expansion, of people who are working, maybe their fortunes shift throughout the year and shift from year to year, but they're able to, to work um, and are able to contribute something to, uh, to pay for insurance coverage, mm -hmm. but are probably best served by being under the Medicaid umbrella because they may shift back into the Medicaid population if they have a bad year or come out into the non-Medicaid population. Yep. Um, and we saw this with the Florida expansion. I mean, the, the ACA in Florida, didn't, they didn't expand Medicaid. Um, there's a huge number of people purchased insurance on the exchanges who were between 100% and 150% of the poverty level. So we know it works. We know people will go and buy insurance if it's available to them, um, even though they're they're pretty poor. So, so the idea is with Medicaid reform, get little skin in the game, get yep. people to participate, get them, you know, interested in in paying a copay or a little bit of a premium and that kind of thing. Hmm. So we got tax credits, insurer options, and Medicaid reform. Right. And like like any great analyst, you have like winners and losers, right? <laughs> Socks. People are like, okay, I got it. I, I got Because this is actually, I mean, for most people, I think healthcare is the hardest thing to understand because you actually have to be educated in ways oh, well, yeah. well beyond. Um, like that's probably why they made me the consumer analyst when I first got my job on Wall Street because I really didn't you have to. Bought, like bought restaurants stuff. and like You're right. just like you have to eat and like very basic level for yeah. me. Yeah. Um, but healthcare is actually it's, it's tough to achieve a, a, a grasp or a, a working knowledge so you can actually be comfortable investing in stocks. That's why we have so many specialists on Wall Street that right. are handsomely paid for being specialists. Right. Um, but you do a good job just get boiling it down to like, what do I buy and what do I sell? Or like, what are the ideas that fall out of this theme? Right. So the, um, in the, the winner's category, uh, if the managed care, insurers that are in the, the managed care space right. um, are probably pretty clear winners, um, especially with Medicaid managed care. Um, and I know I'm very deeply in the minority on this. <laughs> but Very deeply. But very deeply. Very deeply, minority. hugely in the minority. <laughs> hugely in the minority. <laughs> okay. Hugely. So that's called a contrarian? Yeah, I, I yeah. am a kind of a contrarian. Um, but that's, that's just... That, that's, the, well, that's the way the system works. And if you've ever spent any time you know, with state Medicaid issues, the only way to really manage populations for the best dollar value is, is to have a managed care uh, organization yep. in, involved. Um, the next, in terms of winners, low cost providers um, are another. Um, uh, anybody who's going to do it cheaper, better, faster, which is new for healthcare, right? Yeah, it's totally new. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always been, you know, slower, more expensive, <laughs> um, but it, cheaper, better, faster is kind of the watchwords, uh, you know, when you're in a consumer-driven uh, yeah. system. And none of this is linear and none of this is going to happen overnight, um, but low-cost providers, or the, home care, mm -hmm. um, which we talked about before, um, anything that shifts uh, care, especially chronic care, to the, uh, home. To yeah. the home is mm -hmm. ideal. And then uh, telemedicine, which is just, I think, next year finally going to break out because... Um, is that like Teladoc? Yeah, Teladoc is one. Um, then there's a number of insurers have got little telemedicine, up, you know, startups within their, you know, walls that are um, being developed. Insurers obviously love it, right? You mm -hmm. know? <laughs> um, but it has not been reimbursed. Um, the federal government won't reimburse it mm. uh, in, in, in the, a bizarre sort of you know, policy thing. But that's, that's shifting. There's definitely a lot of, wait a minute, let's fix this you know, yeah. kind of thing uh, going on. Um, so those are kind of my top, my top winners. How about losers? Oh. You, you, like, you, you know, you're not afraid to talk about losers. 
Losers? It's anybody who's really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. Right? Yeah. If, you're, if you're ridiculous, uh, if you're a bureaucrat and you're expensive and you have a crappy service and or product, that's I don't want to be part of it. No, exactly. So that's inpatient hospitals. <laughs> that's um, inpatient they, hospitals. That's, Boom. <laughs> <laughs> that's inpatient hospitals. Um, they are very expensive. It's a very expensive site of care. Um, it is... Uh, it, it, it is an in area of the healthcare uh, sector that has been highly protected, especially by the Medicaid program. Oh yeah, and it's huge in dollars. It's yeah. mo it's it's a lot of the dollars. I think it's a third of the spend. We spend three trillion a year on healthcare in this country. If Trump thinks that the F thirty five is expensive, wait till he goes to one of these ho hospitals. <laughs> yeah, wait till he gets a look at <laughs> at a few hip and knee replacements. I know. Um, uh, they they are they're they're very expensive, and they've been seeing this coming for a while. A lot of them are yeah. positioning themselves so that they've got more outpatient. Like uh, a, a hospital chain like HCA now does sixty percent of its business outpatient. Yep. So, um, so it shouldn't come uh, as a as a big um, a, a big surprise. Um, skilled nursing facilities are also in kind of the crosshairs, but they're also a big part of the safety net. Um, so it's hard to see clearly what happens there, but they're definitely gonna be under pressure. And then physicians, um, not your primary care physician, but your specialist. Ah. Um, the orthopedic surgeons, you know, and I don't know about where All you my live. Canadian friends have moved to, uh, to the US to be- Orthopedic surgeons? Yeah, because you get paid a lot of money. Uh, yeah, and you know, there are a lot of big houses in my town built by yeah. orthopedic <laughs> surgeons. <laughs> so they're gonna go after them. Uh, you, you get a hats where there's a big cost there. Yeah. You know, there's a misutilization going on. A lot of people, a lot of operations that don't need to happen, um, or maybe are <laughs> marginal. Um, you know, those those kinds of things, and the reimbursement for them is 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 pretty ridiculous. So, mm. so they're going to be in the crosshairs. I'm back with Joe McMonigle, our energy policy analyst, to talk about Trump and the markets. Trump, has he changed anything, Joe? I think he will change a lot for energy. It'll, yeah. be, it'll be very uh, significant. Uh, you know, the big thing, I think, uh, right out of the box is the end of pipeline politics. You know, the Obama yeah. administration has played a lot of political games and what would have normally been routine regulatory approvals of pipelines and transmission and, and energy export facilities, anything that had some kind of environmental or fossil fuel touchstone to it, mm -hmm. they injected really a political uh, bent to it. So you're gonna see the end of that. And what that means, I think, as we've been saying, you know, for some, quite some time, as recently as, as last week, in, in a note that the Keystone Pipeline, which is you know, TransCanada, and the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is Energy Transfer Partners, those two are going to get approved really quick. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump said uh, over the weekend on one of the Sunday talk shows <clears throat> in an interview that basically he's very frustrated with the time that it's taken for these projects or, or energy projects in general to get approved. And if neither of these are approved uh, before he takes office, he's going to quickly approve them. And I think at least he's referencing the court case now in the Dakota Access pipeline, uh, the courts have consistently sided with the company because uh, there's been several challenges by the Indian tribes and environmental groups. And so this latest you know, uh, delay by the federal government, I think the company is appealing it. Uh, there was uh, court arguments heard on Friday in, in federal court in Washington. And we'll have to wait and see when that um, decision comes out. What else do you get from Trump? What, what, what's on the docket? Yeah, the other big thing is sort of carbon regulation and the whole clean power yeah. plan. And uh, this is another area that Trump has not only said during the campaign that he is going to reverse, but we've, we're starting to see this now in, uh, confirmed in his pick for EPA. Mm. The uh, attorney general from Oklahoma, Scott Pruitt, is very much one of the top leaders of all the attorneys general around the country in opposing the clean power plan. So I think we can pretty much be assured that the EPA is gonna do everything it can to dis dis uh, disassemble the, you know, the carbon regulation and, and really the whole policy that the Obama administration had had launched to sort of decarbonize the economy. Yeah. So, so obviously for the power sector, it's pretty significant. Uh, uh, it's probably gonna create a lot of headwinds for renewable energy companies. Uh, 
you know, the clean power plan was not so much a carbon rule as it was a stimulus program for yeah. renewables yeah. Uh, because it was sort of mandating that states use renewables. And mm -hmm. so they're going to experience, I think, some headwinds here. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there, there are other sectors that are sort of breathing a big sigh of relief yep. because had Clinton won, they would have moved to regulate other sectors of the economy. Mm -hmm. Refiners would have been next, petrochemical, airlines, automakers, you know, you see the high cafe, cafe standards. So I think, you know, there, some industries are going to miss being regulated by a potential Democrat administration. Yeah. And now some can actually see some reversals, like the cafe standards. Yeah. You, could, you could easily see them. Uh, reversing, which would be positive for for oil markets. But you, so you go from a situation where it was all a double down and extend and extend regulation to, wow, this guy's coming in and you can pull X, Y, Z all back. That's right. Is he? Is I mean, it's kind of hard for me to watch any mainstream media at this point. But I mean, it, how would you characterize this new head of the EPA? Is 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 he balanced and practical? Uh, if you're looking at him positively, or is he the you know, out there guy that I guess the left would want to describe him to be. Well, I think he, I think he's going to attract the most opposition of all of Trump's uh, nominees. Oh, now, big time yeah, already. Yeah. Now maybe Tillerson might be a different uh, category <laughs> if he gets, if he gets nominated, although they think he'd be a fantastic pick. But uh, he, he's, he basically opposes the law because he thinks it's illegal. He thinks what EPA has done is not allowed under the Clean Air Act. Yep. So. Uh, he's going to either try to uh, withdraw the rule and come back with something else. Mm -hmm. EPA is kind of, because of Supreme Court decisions, obligated to regulate greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. But they could do it any way. They could emphasize more nuclear. Right. They could emphasize just natural gas. I mean, quite frankly, if the EPA had done nothing on the Clean Power Plan, you'd still probably see those coal retirements mm -hmm. because of low natural gas prices. So. Uh, it's more credit taking more than anything else. So, so as opposed to like an environmental anarchist, he's more of a lawyer who's saying, no, this is illegal. Absolutely. That's yeah. It. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think, we, I mean, obviously I think the Republicans who oppose the clean power plan and carbon regulations are concerned about the impacts on the economy. I think that's a big consideration. Yep. I wouldn't want to gloss over that, but you could see, I think a move in Congress to basically undo that Supreme Court requirement that EPA regulate greenhouse gases. Mm. But they would have to change the law to do it. So they would have to basically pass a, an amendment to the Clean Air Act that basically said greenhouse gases were not, was not meant to be regulated under the Clean Air Act. So okay. that might run into trouble in terms of a filibuster in the Senate. So it might be an uphill climb. But I think Congress is going to try to do that. And that would sort of settle the issue for good. I mean, there would be there would be you know no problem with uh, anything Pruitt wanted to do. And certainly, the other thing to keep in mind is Trump has the Supreme Court pick. Right. There's a tie now in the Supreme Court on this issue, mm -hmm. and so whoever he picks is obviously going to be important for a lot of other issues. But particularly on the clean power plan, it's going to be the deciding vote on whether it's legal or not. Yeah, crazy. I mean, yeah. and then you consider the midterm elections, if the Republicans had a shot, they do have a shot at having a supermajority. There's so many different things that they can, yeah. you know, make the following place. How about Iran? Yeah, Iran is the other big one and certainly has major uh, uh, impacts for oil markets. Yeah. I mean, Trump has said con pretty consistently that he wants to tear up the agreement. Yep. And uh, I think people confuse this with some kind of crazy Trump idea. Mm -hmm. You know, they put it in some box with some other things. That I he, get asked about it every said. single meeting. Yeah. I don't know what to say because I don't know what he said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he basically said he's opposed to it. He thinks it's a, it was one of the worst deals ever negotiated yep. in mankind, you know, type of thing. Uh, but he's against it. And I, I to, to, to the point about it's not being a crazy Trump idea is that every Republican who ran for president was for undoing the deal. And two, it has very bipartisan support in Congress mm. to undo it. And of course, you have to fully know that Israel would be for undoing the agreement. So there would be a lot of momentum behind him doing this. And if he were, just for oil markets, I mean, since sanctions were lifted, Iranian crude exports and or production have has skyrocketed yeah. almost a million barrels a day. All of that physical oil could be taken off the market if the U.S. reimposes sanctions. Mm. 
Now, the Obama administration and people who want to see it continue, or the doubters of, of him doing something, is <clears throat> their central argument is the EU won't go along. We're going to be isolated, and so therefore it won't work. <clears throat> and as I've repeatedly told clients and other people, the EU governments might not go along, but <laughs> if you're an EU energy company or bank or insurance company, that does any kind of business in the U.S. or has any kind of economic exposure to the U.S., you're not going to want to go against U.S. sanctions. Mm -hmm. So it, in effect, is going to uh, establish international sanctions against Iran. Mm -hmm. The only caveat would be there's something there that we don't know that the intelligence communities know. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so maybe after he starts getting uh, intelligence briefings mm -hmm. uh, and meets with his national security team, you know, he may be boxed in to the extent that, you know, Iran's gotten all of the benefits of the right. nuclear deal with the unfrozen assets and the oil revenues. And if he were to reimpose sanctions, it would sort of be an excuse to go back to pursue the nuclear deal. So he may be forced to give it a little bit more time. but. He's given no indication that that's where he's going. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, a, you know, a wild card, right? Mm -hmm. We need to take him at his word. Mm -hmm.